Welcome to a new version of the Green Flame with a new format. We are now offering radical conversations which fearlessly explore taking our understandings to the root, to the origin. The challenge in these conversational explorations will always be to align perspective with reality. Reality is the living, breathing planet, our only home. Reality is our place, our collective place, as humans within her. We dedicate these conversations to seeking truth, the actual state of a matter. We commit the understanding we seek to moving into sane and effective action. The processing of experience and information radically is difficult, yet rejuvenating and so invigorating. We look forward to sharing many radical conversational adventures with our listeners. In this episode, we discuss the film Planet of the Humans, directed by Jeff Gibbs and produced by Ozzie Zayner and Michael Moore. The film shows how the environmental movement, as defined by large environmental organizations, what we call big green environmentalism, has largely been co-opted by corporations and finance and refocused from the natural world to so-called green technology that, despite what we may like to believe, will not and cannot solve the climate problem. The film was released on Earth Day 2020 and has been viewed over 8 million times since then. The backlash to the film by the big green environmentalists was swift. Within days, many big names in these organizations had posted harsh criticism of the film. Because the film dares to question the technologies these organizations have been pushing on us, primarily wind and solar, most criticism focused on how the film got small and inconsequential details of these technologies wrong. For instance, whether solar panels are 8% efficient or 15% efficient. Of course, this misses the point of the film entirely, which is that these technologies are simply a means to keep our industrial civilization going just a little bit longer, so that we may continue to destroy what's left of the natural world. The film's detractors succeeded in removing the film from YouTube for several days in late May and early June, using a copyright claim over four seconds of film. Four seconds that clearly falls under fair use. The film is now available again and continues to be offered for free. In this conversation, we discuss some of the questions raised by the film, the authoritarian nature of modern-day solar, wind, and biomass technologies, our responses to the film, parts of the film that resonated with us most deeply, perhaps the most controversial topic touched on the film, population, how the media fails to communicate the full impacts of technology, the film as part of the conversation about the price of technology in our lives, and more. Okay, so welcome everybody. We're going to talk about the planet of the humans today. It is a film that illustrates some of the problems with renewable energy, wind, solar, and biomass specifically, and exposes the corporate funding and conflicts of interest in ben many of the big name organizations that back these technologies. So essentially it's about a climate movement that's been co-opted by these corporations and about how they offer the false promise that the wealthy of the world can continue to live our lives basically as we have been without having to change, thanks to so-called green energy. The movie makes the case that these technologies cannot in fact solve the climate problem and that the pretense that they can is contributing to the destruction of the climate and the environment. And the film also shows that the people involved in these industries know that the technologies are false solutions, but that the public in general does not. And that the public believes the corporations and the environmental leaders they are working with so most of the film is concerned with showing that green energy, green energy, solar and wind are made with fossil fuels and are destructive to the land, that biomass, basically trees, um, is destroying forests and that these forms of generating energy are being used to continue our destructive way of life. I would like to start with um, everybody kind of introducing themselves and tell me if you have seen the film and if you have read or listened to any of the responses to the film. So Michelle, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I did see the film not too long after it came out, and I have not found time to rewatch it before this discussion, but, but I did see it. And 
Um, and then I'm not on social media much, but I, I was told by friends about some of the responses. I wasn't like following them myself, but um, I guess I was contacted by a friend a couple of weeks after I had seen the film. She texted me, a friend in, in Fairbanks, so um, not close enough that I can get together with her in person, but, but she texted me and said, um, hey, you should watch this film. I've, I've heard about it. I haven't watched it yet, but I'd be interested to get your responses about it. She, we at that point hadn't had very deep conversations, but she knew me as an environmentalist. And, um, but then like within an hour after that, she texted me back and she said, oh no, I talked to, to an, or maybe it was a day later. She said, I talked to some environmentalist friends of mine here in Fairbanks. And they said, you know, that there's a lot of just slander involved and here's, um, Bill McKibben's response in Rolling Stone magazine. And, and she still hadn't seen the film at this point. So I responded back to her and I told her, um, anyway, this is probably more than what I need in just an introduction, but this, that's, <laughs> that's what I've come, come across in terms of response to the film. And then we've had a little more, we haven't fully discussed the film since then, but I still need to do that with her. <laughs> Uh, but I let her know that that I was glad that there was somebody saying these things and that I, I agreed with it re regardless of what Bill McKibben has to say about it. <laughs> um, so that's me. Well, thank you, Michelle. Trindy, do you want to go? Yeah, uh, I, I'm from Denver. I've seen the film a, a couple times now. I re-audited it this morning just now before the Zoom and I had a similar experience uh, after I saw it, a friend, uh, Jennifer, uh, asked me what I thought of it and um, I and what I had seen of the responses and I'm such a hermit, I really have no even periscope for that kind of thing. So I just kind of kept my head down and um, heard about the flag you know, very much as from third party perspective. and. I uh, was just so impressed with um, with Michael Moore uh, standing by Gibbs in this um, because I think he has more to lose as far as popularity goes, and I thought that was awesome for him to fund this and um, and risk that. That that was amazing. Uh, so that's me. Thank you, Salonica. Do you want to go next? Yeah, so um, I watched the film after you suggested actually in the forum and and I watched it uh, two days back, like we like watched it and uh, yeah, I've not really, uh, yeah, I've read a couple of responses to the movie and I also, I guess I watched a small YouTube video as a response to it, like that was like a negative response to it mm, and most of the things that i've read are um on the um that kind of uh, that did a, like you know a positive response to the movie i guess that i was pretty selective <laughs> that way and yeah and yeah i yeah i read the review and it was pretty great yeah, I guess so. thank you all right arati do you want to go next yeah. Um, yeah, so I watched the movie shortly after Salnika suggested it, um, and we briefly discussed it with um, both Angela and Salnika, but I haven't um, had the chance to rewatch it before this meeting, and I also haven't uh, read any of the responses to it. So I'm looking forward to this discussion. Cool. Thank you. Jennifer? Hi. Um, I live on the occupied lands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho people just north of Trinity. So I'm in Colorado, the front range of the Rockies. It's really nice to meet you. <laughs> um, and so I watched the film as soon as it came out on Earth Day here and had a very positive response to it that this has been needing to be said for a very long time and also kind of awed by the dive from Michael Moore, who is a very... Um, dear figure to my family as far as this filmmaking and approaching environmental issues. Michael Moore and Jeff Gibbs come from the hometown of my mother. So there's a cultural understanding there 
of what Flint, Michigan is all about and the long struggles, especially in labor organizing and the social issues that Michael Moore has dealt with in the past have um, really been close to my family's heart because we understand as a family where that comes from and what Flint, Michigan and its history are about. And so I was really impressed with that. I have been posting positive reviews consistently ever since the movie came out as a way of kind of trying to keep the interest going. And um, that's all I've got to say for right now. Um, I mean, the conversations that I've had, had have been within you know, anti-civ circles um, with, with people within DGR. And we've been you know, saying this since the beginning and it's refreshing to have a icon in the United States in filmmaking saying it too. So that's all I've got for now. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Angela? Hi, um, I watched the movie, um, the documentary after I got a link from Salonika, my friend, and then, yeah, I discussed with, it with Aarti and Salonika. Um, about the reviews, I haven't, um, seen much. I saw somebody share a link about um, what Michael Moore gets wrong in the documentary, but like I, I didn't open the link. So I, I know there has been criticism, but I, I haven't read it. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. So one of the interviews I listened to with Jeff Gibbs, the, the director and filmmaker, was with Max Wilbert of DGR on the Green Flame. And um, he asked Jeff to describe the message of the movie. And Jeff said that he didn't make the movie to send a message, but rather to suggest and ask questions. And so I thought it might be good to discuss uh, a question that the film asks and how you might respond to that question. So for instance, one question that I thought the film asked basically was, is it possible for machines made by industrial civilization to save us from industrial civilization? And he asked this question fairly early in the film, about 17 minutes in. And to me, that was kind of the fundamental question of the film. So I'd, I'm curious what your reactions to that question are, or if you have another question that you thought the film asked that you particularly resonated with that you might want to answer for yourself. I was having a conversation along these lines with a friend here that I spent some time with yesterday talking about the, in fact, we were discussing this film. Um, she brought it up and, and we were discussing it and she was really glad to see it come out. And, um, and she tends to come from a place of just disgust with, with humans is, is what she talks about a lot when, when I hear her talk about the state of the world. Um, and I, I try to qualify it when I, when I have a chance and, and to throw in, well, it's, it's civilized humans. You know, there are humans who, who know how to, who have and, and do live on this planet in a way that, that is good. But, um, but she was talking about, you know, having seen the film and having seen like, okay, obviously biofuel is just completely destructive to the planet. Um, she said, okay, well, so why, why don't we do, what about things like turbines in in the oceans to um, to create electricity from tidal power? Like like that that's the answer, right? Or um, and she mentioned something else along a similar vein. And I said, well, where where's the where are the metals and the the steel to make these giant turbines going to come from? And she thought about that for a minute. And and ultimately, I you know I just went ahead and said to her. Yeah, I'm trying not to go off on people so much, but uh, it seemed like the appropriate moment to just go ahead and say, like, listen, humans have lived with electricity, like some of us, for like a hundred years. You know what? Actually, humans don't need electricity, and can't we? We can't have it. We can't. We can't have electricity if we're going to have a living planet. Um. Anyway, so that's the conversation that I had about that yesterday. Is um. Yeah. No. We we can't have a living planet, and machines, industrial machines, can't have it. <laughs> Anybody else want to talk about a question you think the film asked and your response, Sonica? Okay. I want 
to like talk about the question that you posed. Um, so um, I, I think the main concern over this, like if in machines of industrial civilization can save us from it, is that uh, the machines that we're talking about right now, they were never created to save us from the industrial civilization, but to sustain the industrial civilization. So I guess that should be a main point. We do, we can use tools created by the industrialized civilizations to like, you know, to organize basically. The main thing is that they are there to perpetuate the system instead of like saving us from it. Uh, yeah, I guess I just want to add a little to what Salnika just said, and I agree. Um, the machines that we have, they are meant to perpetuate the system. And I think when we look at machines and their use, we should focus on like the intention why with what we why we're using them. Um, there are like definitely certain like many perks to machines and technology, especially in the medical care domain. So we don't want to like disregard them completely but also like look into the intentions of the organizations or the companies that are funding these machines. Like, why are they doing it? Is it their profit that they worry about the most at the end, at, at the end of the day? So uh, reducing the use of machines um, so that they're only used when it's necessary. Um, do we need electricity as much as we use these days? Probably not. How can we cut demand um, so that the essential use of electricity is still still there like um maybe for like ventilators in hospitals and stuff like that but we don't need lights in our houses 24 7 or like in malls um 24 7 so like separating the essential and non-essential use of machines um i think would be a good way to go about figuring out whether uh, we can keep using them whether we really need them or not yeah i I would like to add to that. I think that's a really important point. I'm blessed with a, a copy of Dreams at the moment, and there's this talk of what do the people who wish us, wish us ill want on this side and other sides, and um, you know that that deal, that devilish deal that was brought up. Um, with so, <clears throat> so many characters, but specifically with Al Gore, you know, because he's just such a caricature of this, that what do you get trading a living planet for bars of gold? What does that really do for you? Um, because it can't be the bars of gold. That's just a, a way to act out on an addition. The, that's not the source of the hungry ghost. That's not gonna satisfy, you know, the, that technic, not being neutral will ever make the whole greater kind of thing. And I think I think that's a really important question. What are they? Is it um, a desire for oblivion? Is it uh, pure sadism? Is it is it just the the trauma that makes this that makes the um, inability to to self reflect to the point of psychopathy? I think you know I don't I don't know. But I think I really, I think that's a super important point. Yeah, and one of the things I was thinking about as I was preparing for this was about Lewis Mumford's description of democratic technologies and authoritarian technologies. And I was thinking about how, you know, biomass, which is the word for wood, essentially. I mean, humans burned wood to cook and heat for thousands of years. The Dutch had small wooden wind turbines for hundreds of years. You can still see basic wooden wind turbines in rural areas sometimes. We've had passive solar, passive solar homes or, or solar hot water, just you know, putting a dark object into the sun with water in it to heat the water. So I think to me, these used to be what Mumford would call democratic technologies, that is personal small scale, sustainable. They are now, they have now been shifted into this realm of authoritarian technologies, meaning technologies that, that are global in scale, require massive amounts of resources to create, require corporations to build and install and manage. 
So it's interesting to think about the, uh, that transition that's happened and why it's happened. And so one of my questions that I wrote was, why have we transitioned these technologies from democratic to authoritarian? And is that an inevitable consequence of industrial civilization that these useful technologies that we had have been co-opted into their authoritarian forms in order to meet the growth imperative of industrial civilization, of course. My answer is yes, of course, that's why. <laughs> but, um, but it was interesting to kind of contemplate that transition that's happened for those specific technologies discussed by the film. So I'm curious what you all think about that. So what I think about the film itself is the film is an attempt to ask the questions and put it back into the democratic process through uh, artistic medium that we're pretty familiar with. Um, one of the criticisms of the film is it doesn't offer any answers. That's not the point for me at all. The point is to force the communal conversation around the truth. What is the true cost of what's happening with these technologies? And the only conclusion that I can come through, come to, and it's, not just because of kind of the facts of how this is extracted, but the visceral reaction to watching what the price is for non-humans is no, it's not acceptable. That the cost is incredibly high. And I know a little bit from having listened to indigenous people where I live about what the process is within an indigenous community when it comes to new tools that you have to take responsibility for those tools and how they're created. And you have to contemplate that deeply. And you have to make a communal decision about whether the price and the responsibility and the amount of power those tools hold is going to be of benefit to the community or not. And I love that this filmmaker filmmakers are forcing those questions. The point is not answers. The point is the communal discussion. And the conclusions for me is the price and the power within them is incredibly destructive and could only be forced upon us by a technocratic aristocracy that is only is interested in exploitation and control. That's where I'm at with not only the film, but with that question. Thank you so much for asking these brilliant questions. I totally agree with you, Jennifer. And, and that gets to another question that I asked, and I don't want to derail this question, but what you said about indigenous communities questioning the role of technology and how as a culture now we do not do that at all. I mean, we just sort of come, corporations come up with these technologies. They've, they come out because it's good to innovate and grow and, so of course new technology is going to be good and and we don't we don't have a, a process for ever questioning despite the fact that the corporations have fought through all the contingencies they know many of the potential problems of their the technologies that they're going to unleash upon the world but the public doesn't ever have a chance to say whether or not we want these technologies or not and so they never get discussed and i totally agree with you that this film is a great part of, of the discussion that we should be having about these new technologies. Yeah, I have the fortune of reading about the, the spiritual debt incurred the, that speaks to that, uh, specifically around making a knife, the story. I apologize if it's redundant to those of you who have read the story of the knife debt, but the, the ritual sacrifices that have to be made at every stage of creation for any item from the inspiration of its conception uh, to its process of extraction because everything that we make comes from something else. Yeah. And, and I think talking about spiritual debt is something that is also not happening because it's so awkward and because so much of that uh, has tended to revolve around spiritual dogmas that are just untenable, that make people uncomfortable, that don't have um, moving power. And speaking to the, the spirits of different lands, they belong where they are and they don't like to move. 
And so what works for one space won't work for another space. And so when it comes to sharing ideas about how to pay spiritual debt, I think there's, there's a lot of stifling, not just in monotheistic religions, but also in um, our ability to communicate with the land in this way. I'd be interested in talking more about that. And I think that the idea of having a, a council conversation around this specifically is, would be incredibly productive, you know, kind of kicking it up a notch from considering radical feminism as a, as a shared personal stories, but, but incorporating these non-human species into that conversation. That would be, that, I think that's a great idea. Jennifer brought up and I, I would be interested in continuing that conversation past this if anyone else wants to do that. So talking about how uh, we were we transitioned from more democratic um, sources of energy to more authoritarian ones. Um, so I, so I think like before having before talking to Sonika and Aarti, I think like I thought we are making great strides climate wise because the way these things are advertised, it seems like we're doing great um, with all the divestment efforts in colleges and things like that. So this was really eye opening. Um, so I feel like. Part of the reason is that we sometimes are unaware, we are not told about, like we don't know the realities of all of these things that are happening. So we, like we don't talk about it, and then that's silently, you know, quietly consenting to all of these changes. Um, and the other thing that I was curious about was um, the alternatives that we have, um, because there's there are big corporations, and then they provide, like they get to determine what the sources of energy are going to be. Um, and I wonder if the, if there have been more communal local efforts about changing the sources of energy to something else and the art and do the big corporations inhibit such um, ideas or like such work. So. Yeah, I think we've seen that with even the solar industry where people who wanted to put solar panels on their roof are discouraged from doing that by the big solar industry because the solar industry wants to have the big solar farm so that they can control it, hook it up to the main grid and have total control over pricing and all of that kind of stuff. So I think that is another way that solar has been co-opted from democratic to authoritarian just recently. An example of what you're talking about, I think, if I'm understanding you correctly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that that's yeah, that's good to know because these things like you know, like people it's not all it's not, you can't find it easily on the news, you know? The permaculture communities that I have encountered, Beth, when you said something about going back technologically, I know permaculture people who have done incredible things with passive solar, just, you know, letting the sun's light be captured. You know, the simpler the technology, the more agreeable and democratic it is as far as access. You know, you can, you can make your own sausages, so to speak. You can make your own energy capture the sun's light yourself. But then you get, bump into um, other forms of oppression. They're all interlocked. The, the, the people who are able to do this still have land under their feet that they can belong to. And for so many humans, we have been, you know, kicked upstairs into an apartment without our feet on the ground, sometimes without even being able to, to freely walk into the sun because you're constantly, you know, enslaved to making money and being a subject of, of the capitalist wheel. You know, you're a cog in the wheel. So I think that maybe some of the answers are older, belong to our ancestors, and are in, you know, it engages us in another struggle about once again belonging to the land and not letting them own the land anymore. And that's a big, that's a big fight. Or even going yeah. beyond ownership to where right. not even owning, we're just living with the land. In that's a, right. Yeah. That's the, that, you know, that's, that's for Europeans, that's a really old sense of the commons, of communally 
belonging on land that was stolen. And then, you know, there's, and another thing that the film brings up that, that is, it's criticized for is, you know, the number of people on the planet. And the best answer to that one is empower women and their reproductive autonomy. You know, it doesn't get any better than that. So you can't, I don't think you can go here environmentally without talking about a lot of different issues. And they brushed up into them and said they're there. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting because I posted the, the movie on my social media and then like, people did tell me um, I, the correct way to think about this is to think about consumption, but not about population, um, population growth as in, yeah, so I, I was like, I, I didn't know there were the, you know, there were criticisms about um, saying um, that this, there are way too many people in the world. One of the things that the documentary says too. Um, so I was just listening um, because I don't think I have correct data to determine whether population is a problem or consumption is a problem or both are a problem. Yeah, I have found personally that that's a topic that is almost impossible to discuss with anybody because it's so emotional for people. And I understand that, but it means that it's very hard to have rational discussions about it, which is, you know, I think we have to be able to talk about it as difficult as it is. It is so emotional. I mean, personal is the perfect word. I mean, when it comes to the love of your child, there is, there is nothing like it. And we're, I mean, I'm so glad that this is all women today because, uh, the pull of life is so strong. Even if you know that you can't or you shouldn't or you are not going to or that you will, that the power of life and death is felt throughout those years. And there's just no getting around it. And especially in a in a partnered love, not to say that you can't um feel this on your own i mean i definitely remember when i turned 30 like, everything quickened and i was like men you know like, <laughs> on the prowl and that you know from a very young age i had decided i i understood what i had to do but it didn't have anything to do with what my body wanted what my animal needs are and it's just like a plant you know i long for the bee to come along um or the butterfly, you know, whatever happens, let it happen. And having to override that, you know, speaking to the, the movie's intro about restraint, having to override that has rested on us put in this impossible position, not only economically, educationally, socially, where we're just at the bottom of every pecking order, but that we're expected to have all this self-control. We're expected to be responsible for all our subsequent generations. Like we're not animals. Like we're not longing to bear fruit and be a part of this world in that way. And I think that makes it really hard to, to talk about with the people that we love who have children, who have maybe at one point or another made that choice and forsaken it, or who didn't have a choice, or you know, for whatever reason, we love their children not quite like they do, but we're glad that they're here. Even if we wonder what it's gonna be like for them, even if we know what it's gonna be like for them. And I, I mean, I, that's, yeah, that, that is why it's been hard for me, for the love, for the love of the people that I know, for the love of their children that I, feel communally responsible for now, which I think is the biggest lifestyle cop out for me that, you know, how I tell myself, I could never forgive myself if I had a daughter because I know what life would be for her. And that exempts me from having to make sure that that world isn't like that for her. You know, I can just say, well, I didn't, but then my friends have daughters and I feel responsible for them now. And I don't know how to talk about that with them either, because I love them. 
There are a lot of deep issues raised by this film, I think. <laughs> so I, another question that I wanted to talk about was what part of the story in the film was told most powerfully for you and why? And I think uh, my response to that question is there's a scene in the film where this guy says, the beauty of this technology, solar in particular, is that it is so environmentally benign. And then the film shows a bush hog machine eating a 500 year old Joshua tree. And it just broke my heart. For me, I guess there were two scenes. The first one was the montage of, like, you know, of how these are produced. Like, I don't know how long it was. Like, it just showed about the, the mining and, you know, from the rare earth metals all the way to the EVs in Tesla. So, yeah, I, for me, that one was really powerful. And the second one was. You know, uh, there was a scene where Al Gore was talking about, he didn't know about the deforestation in Amazon and then there were clips of like indigenous people in Amazons who were taken out of their land and who's so basically their only home, like the home for of their, like, that they have lived for like thousands of years and that's getting destroyed right before their eyes. And then there was Al Gore in other part of the world saying, like, and he has the power to decide what's happening to these people. And yeah, that was really strong for me. For me, the, the scene with the orangutan uh, at the end and the fires in the beginning with the lights, the orangutan really got me, you know, seeing creatures move to the other side in front of us, the detachment, the look of just the just the the disgust and the uh, I it, the way that they handled the orangutan at the end made me think of uh, that Judy Grant poem, a woman is talking to death with the you know the six big policemen, no child in them, you know that recurring theme just that brutish invasion and then the seeing seeing the light of this creature fade and go away and not trust anymore and to see um, that reflected to see the orangutan seeing us really seeing us for what we are it made me deeply ashamed yeah, a couple a couple of months now after having seen the film. Um, yeah, that's those are the images that stay with me too. Are the those ones at the very end? Those those film uh, those images, yes, are the ones that 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 brought me to a like an emotional crisis point. You're watching what business as usual does and it it feels like watching the film of, of george floyd being killed before your eyes it's you know this is what this system does and now you have to like decide there's no going back you can't go back this is what it is you can't watch this and continue to participate in it. And I know that Beth, one of the things that you asked was, what do you think that these points of incredible impact are going to do? Does that strengthen resolve? Or does it cause you to just crumble in terror and horror at what you've just seen? And the answer for me personally, at least, is it's like a door shutting. It's like, I can't pretend anymore. This is what is happening. Either I get on with, you know, like making this stop. But if I stay silent now, having seen it, then I'm complicit. That's kind of the moral imperative that's offered for me with the most impactful parts of this film. Is this is this is truth. 
So here's a follow-up question because I spoke to a friend a couple of days ago who had, she's very much in, you know, alignment with a lot of this thinking, but she had a very visceral reaction of feeling manipulated by the film, her emotions feeling manipulated in the sense of, you know, picking these scenes that tug at our heartstrings without sort of showing the other side or I don't know. And I, and I, and I'm not, and maybe, you know, going back to something Arachi said near the beginning about, you know, machines and industrialism being uh, good for, you know, medical purposes and helping health outcomes and that sort of thing. And, you know, that was sort of the only thing that I could think of that might be sort of another side to this. But um, anyway, I'm just really curious about what you said, Jennifer, will this fuel your resolve? Or did you feel manipulated in any way by these emotional scenes in the movie? Um, yeah. You know, when you think about the people watching the movie, you know, the, the people who do respond with, I, I'm not going to let this happen anymore. This fuels my resolve versus, I, you know, things are so bad, I'm crumbling and I'm going to be in denial because I can't take it versus the people who say, oh, you're just manipulating me and I don't, I want to, you know, I want to, see another side so that I don't feel so manipulated kind of response to it. My immediate reaction to that is just like, what are you talking about? You know, I mean, you could make an entire, this, you know, all the, all the babble that goes on about facts and figures and, and this is what the process looks like. And then there's this mass of what's actually happening. I don't feel manipulated at all. I feel like, you know, that you could, you know, that, that, that they were very deliberate and careful that, that yes, you are going to see it, but what we can't, you know, it, to really know exactly what the cost is and to really see all of it, that might, you know, overwhelm you to the point where you can't handle it. I mean, it was just like little bitty chinks of what the real cost is to non-humans. It wasn't manipulation. It was just like, we're going to have to like show you just a tiny piece here because if you really saw it all, that, I mean, yeah, what manipulation? I don't get that. I, I, that, felt that, 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 that actually, that actually aggravates me that, that somebody. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that they, they could have shown so, so, so much more and so much worse. And I'm sorry, but no amount of success in business and economy can offset that. First, one of the things that I would like to add is that, um, and when they talk about the manipulation and everything, like that's the one hour, 40 minutes of movie that they're talking about. And all of the rest of the time, all of the messages fed by the media, like isn't that manipulation? Like, they never showed the other side of things, right? And yeah, that is what I was really thinking right now. And um, actually, I kind of understand like why they would say that they are getting manipulated because like yeah, they identify too much with this culture, and it's kind of like a psychological reaction of like you know. But when I first found out that like solar panels have cost yeah it did take me a, some time to digest the fact because like i just bought in too much to the ideas that renewables are going to save us and everything so like yeah i guess perhaps it's one of those reactions but then yeah it didn't take me that long <laughs> maybe they're just maybe like you know uh, i read a review somewhere that you know there are two groups of people who watch the entirely different movies when they watch this documentary. So it's like, you know, it depends on the level of connection that they feel with the, I don't know, I don't know, maybe they are on different stages of understanding or something. So someone at one point would, they would feel manipulated and then someone would at the other point would just feel that like they're feeling like they're being misled and everything. So they are just trying to hold on to this kernel of you know, hope that when you 
course, I'm going to save them. So um, I'm jumping ahead of the discussion, but like one of the major arguments I saw was that you know that the data used in the documentary was out of date. And that just completely misses the picture that even if they're using the data like a few years back, but the argument still holds. Like, you know, it's still true, right? So for me, it was very, very refreshing. Like, yeah, yeah. So it just depends. Like, whoever saw the movie, whatever point of light they are, whatever point of understanding they are at. I guess that like that affects a lot how they understand the movie. Yeah, I think you make a really good point, Solanka, because the the manipulation is coming from the renewable energy companies too. And for instance, I notice in all of the literature that you see about renewable energy, it's always these beautiful pictures of wind turbines in these beautiful green fields or solar panels on on these beautiful hillsides, and they make it look as pretty as they possibly can. And it's sort of like, that is manipulation right there. <laughs> and I just wanted to add, so the, a lot of the things that we see in the movie about um, animals, life and plant life getting destructed, it's not something that's unique to this documentary. Like we see it in other documentaries as well. So as long, the, I think what this added was like showing how renewable sources are not actually uh, um, useful for the environment. So it just, just that link was something that's like that, that is definitely new. But the other things, it's not really manipulation because you see it everywhere. You see it in so many documentaries. And if you haven't seen them before, maybe you feel manipulated or if you're unaware of all of that. But I think most of the people at least now are aware. And um, it's, it's like, it's ubiquitous almost. So, yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think in general, the, the messaging we get about technologies, no matter what the technology is, is primarily from the corporations and the, the people who, who will most benefit from those technologies, no matter what it is. So we're, we're never getting the full truth really ever about any of this. Yeah, I'm reading as you could probably tell from my questions, um, Jerry Mander's book, In the Absence of the Sacred, and which is basically all about, it was the perfect book to read after seeing the movie because it's, it's a book about technology and how it impacts our lives and our thinking and our culture and everything. And, um, you know, he, he has a chapter about television and doing research in indigenous communities where you know, they didn't have television and relatively recently got television. And, you know, the Canadian government in, in partnership with broadcasting and, and, you know, the advertisers and the co corporations who stand to benefit the most from more people having television, were really pushing it on them, pushing hard. And the result is that within even just a couple of years, some of these communities completely changed be just because of getting television. And... It just really opens your eyes about this, these things that we just take for granted in our lives that utterly change how we are as human animals interacting with one another. Well, I wanted to ask what, if anything, you learned from the movie that might have been new and surprising. I'm, I'm not sure I learned too much new that, that I wasn't already aware of in the film. Um, I think for me, the, the, the thing that struck me the most was sort of the level of deny, denial and ignorance about civilization. The, the, there's a scene at the beginning of the movie where uh, the, he shows the head of the woman who's in charge of GM, and she's talking about electric cars. And they go outside and they show plugging the electric car in, and he asks her about the energy that's charging the car and she talks about well it's probably coal and he you know he says well so how is the basically he's saying how does the electric car help then and she's like well you know it's not bad <laughs> i'm just like wow the level of denial is deep 
So anyway, that was that was one thing that really struck me about the film. Yeah, for me also, I guess the major thing that I learned was that I didn't know that you know the side of argument that I'm in was so strong, and that the opposite side was so uh, like weak. I mean. Like, you know, I knew about the mining and everything, but then, like, you know, when they say that they make it, for, they make the solar panels from silicon, and they're not actually using silicon, they're, they're using coal. So, yeah, I did not know the, the intricate details of whatever was happening. And also about the mountain top removals, like, and that's so, uh, like, there's mountain top removals for coal that is bad. And there is mountain top removal for wind power that is supposed to be good. And it's just like so striking. And I guess the major things I've learned was from the uh, the responses that I've got from a few of my friends. And I was talking to a, a friend who was who has been active in this environmental activism. And then his response was Basically, yeah, just finding the tiniest bits of fault with the movie. And it's just like, and then I showed it to like Artie and Angela and they had a positive response to it, right? So it just made me realize that most of the environmental activists are so much, like they've bought in so much to this argument and they've invested so much of their time and energy to this that they get very defensive about it. Like if you show it to a, an open-minded lay person, then they're more likely to be accepting of this. Then if you show it to a hardcore envi mainstream environmentalist, I don't know if it's actually like learning from the documentary, but that, that is one thing that I really understood well <laughs> after this. Um, I guess one thing that I'm hoping to learn from the movie that harkens back to who made it is what happens when you have a serious social, a filmmaker who is seriously so, socially critiqued to culture and done it for decades, cross over into the environmental line and start telling truth about, about what's happening in the environmental movement. And what I'm hoping I learn is that that is a, is a way of creating coalitions. Not everybody can face down the truth, but if you can pull that body of work together, what happens? I mean, this whole film was a surprise to me that it came out of Michael Moore at all, that it came out of Jeff Gibbs. It, it blew me away. And I see so much potential there that I'm hoping that I learn that in, you know, what we would call over here reds and greens can get together and fight together on common cause and understand each other in really deep ways. And I agree with you, Salonika. I mean, when you're entrenched in a dogma, no matter what it is, you can't see. You can only kind of set up a defense against that construct crumbling. And my, you know, this is, this is about truth seeking. It's not about answering questions, it's about truth seeking and providing that to the community. Back to what I said at the beginning. I hope I'm not spinning in circles too much, but I'm excited about that and I hope that I learned that, that it creates more coalitions. I feel like that I also learned a lot about denial, both internally and externally. I feel like I came into this movie with a little bit of arrogance because I thought that I already knew all of this because I because I already agreed with the premise. I thought that that it was largely going to be redundant and tedious and I found it to be the exact opposite that knowing something intellectually has sweet nothing to do with bearing witness and understanding something in your body and that all of those are necessary and bearing witness changed 
my body knowledge in a big way. Mm, thank you for that, Trinity. I really, oh, yeah, I totally agree with you. Thank you. Anyone else? Michelle, you look like you might have something to say. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm not sure I do. Okay. Uh, no, it was just for me. It was mostly just um, really exciting to hear to see somebody with with a loud voice and and the ability to pull in a large audience say these things in that way. Um, yeah, it was it was uh, surprising and and really great. Well, a lot of people complained that the film raises a lot of questions and concerns about these issues, but doesn't offer any concrete solutions. And we have touched on this, but I wanted to kind of bring that, bring it back. And, and I could see some hints at, at concrete solutions in the film, particularly around consumptions and consumption and understanding the depth of the denial and, and, and other things that clearly we need to think about. Although I, feel like a lot of the reviewers completely missed a lot of these points but um you know a lot of reviewers say well there's no concrete solution suggested in the film so i'm curious do you see that as a problem do you see it as a good thing about the film jeff has said in in interviews that you know he meant this as just the opening part of a long conversation that needs to happen that's kind of how i see it and going back to what we talked about earlier as a way to open the discussion about the implications of technology in, in, in our lives and in the culture and what these technologies actually imply. So I, so I just want, kind of wanted to bring it back to that question specifically and, and talk about that, if you have anything to say about that. I definitely do. I, I felt like that was a kind of um, a, a self-preservation act, that if this film was to be the buoy that it needs to be, it can't talk about that because this was so controversial enough apparently <laughs> and, and the solutions are even more so they only get more emotional and harder to talk about and harder to do from there i found that this especially when it comes to being land-based that takes nothing short of revolution physical power revolution I, I don't live in the country i wish i did um, but there is, I don't stand a chance in hell of organizing with my neighbors in this urban area to overthrow the government so that we can reclaim our land and start a community garden that is real so that we can tear up the streets and make the change that needs to happen. There is zero chance of that happening. The, the need for, for global organization is kicked up a notch, which makes us dependent on these authoritarian techniques, which makes us, again, part of that Ouroboros. And I don't, I mean, yeah, it's just so, so hard to talk about that I don't think that he could in this, but that we definitely need to. I think that um, the people who make this argument are kind of missing the point of this documentary, basically. Like, it, was, it was specifically, like, from watching it, what I thought was that it was specifically made to not offer solutions. It was like, you know, it was created just so that to show that the issue is really complex and that the, so like, if you give one solution, that's not going to work. I mean, even if it works perfectly at the moment, maybe capitalism can co opt it and then it would just be totally opposite to what it was proposed to be. They are trying to show it, like the producers are trying to show that that's what happened when the green solutions came along, like the renewable came along as a solution, right? So they're just showing that there's no particular solution to it. And if you give one solution and if it becomes a dogma, then people just fail to realize the problems with it. So, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, um, so one of the other things that I got from this documentary was they showed to the extent to which overconsumption, like overconsumption is a problem. And I think that um, coming up solutions with that is very different for different countries, different people, because the lifestyles are so different. So like 
these are like so Salnika and Angela from Nepal and reducing consumption in Nepal means something different completely different than reducing consumption when you're living in the U.S. or um, in a western country so I feel like like just by showing the issue it, it kind of pres- it ha- it can't they can't give us a like a whole one problem one solution fits all um but it it's like opens up ways for you to think about how you can um reduce consumption or make your um lifestyle more environmentally friendly like in uh, in Nepal we, i think a lot of people started doing like rooftop farming um as a way of like planting vegetables making the area more green um and i know that's not really possible when there's in places where there's snow and like those roof rooftops um so i feel like just by showing the um problems it it like it helps it shows people that there are different ways like they have their they can adopt their own ways of finding solutions to these problems yeah so i i was going to say something similar um i thought um, so the thing that was really powerful for me about the documentary was that um it it said um we're only able to sustain in this earth because of industrialized agriculture and the earth cannot sustain industrialized agriculture so that's it's so it did show this how severe this problem is uh, and um, and then i think in showing that it offered a solution as in like we need to reduce what we are doing to the earth um and and like not consuming a lot is a way um is and that was the solution one of the solutions i think like it's showing the problem and then it's showing the root cause so rather than like tackling at like you know subsidiary branches as in like new in in uh, so alternatives to fossil fuel that are not really effective like you have to get at the root cause too so i i thought there's a solution so like i yeah uh, i didn't properly understand the criticism in that uh, i listened to um derek jensen's interview with jeff gibbs i didn't catch max's interview with him but but i listened to derek's interview with him and um and i was I don't know if surprised is the right word, but but Jeff definitely um, made it clear that he's not an anti-civilization person, that that's not where he's coming from. And he's certainly not trying to suggest that um, he's, he's not trying to suggest what Deep Green Resistance as an organization is trying to suggest, which is that um, there's what's necessary is a dismantling of the of the system of industrial civilization. Um, so it was interesting just to hear him like step back and say, no, that's like, I, I don't really necessarily agree with that, but I just want to have the conversation. Like I, we, we have to actually start from what's, what's the truth, what's the actual situation that we exist in. We have to start from here and have real conversations. And I don't know what the answer is and I'm not willing to go there. I'm not willing to go there where you all are going, but, um, but we have to be able to have real conversation. So that was just an interesting, yeah, interesting to to hear him say that. I've I've been thinking about this stuff for a very long time. And um, to me, it seems completely obvious that industrial civilization needs to come down if we're going to keep a living planet. But, um, but it's, yeah, it was just interesting, refreshing to hear a person who's somewhere somewhere in, in um, at least wanting to get at what's possible, what's true, who's at a different point, and maybe a completely different process with that, with that whole thought process than I have been on, but I'm certainly glad that, that they put out there that truth and at least are wanting to have the conversation it was really refreshing, d- despite not having come to definite conclusions about what it all means. Yeah, I mean, that takes a lot of, I feel like, courage and, and honesty to come from that place of like, I don't know the answers, but we have to start a conversation from here's the actual situation that we're in. It takes a lot of vulnerability. Um, I don't know that I have much to add to the brilliance of this circle and everything that's been said so far, but I do want to say and reflect something about this is a film that can, that unique that comes from a you know a first world perspective ultimately, and is a myth debunks a myth. That, that green energy works, and that's great. 
but what global capitalism and, and this whole system of repression has done to the entire planet, every single answer is going to be different for every single community. The answers that Trinity and I can find together, you know, where we are on this land will be very different than what, what you women will find someplace else, you know, in Nepal. So we don't have universal answers. We shouldn't have, we can't have universal answers to, to what it needs to happen next. And I, you know, I can only pull from the brilliance of my local community. That's who I can face with. Those are the people that I can actually interrelate with. And I know there's brilliance on the other side of the planet that I have no idea, you know, where you can go or what you have, but I know there's brilliance there. So I'm, I'm really encouraged that there wasn't any answer given. <laughs> it would be so inappropriate. What Jeff and Michael Moore is like, what they're trying to do with this film is just to just to start a discussion, like just to sh add the piece to this to the discourse that has been missing for a long time, especially in the environmental movement and also in the public discourse. I mean, there have been voices that have showed this, like they've talked about this like deep resistance and like any other like so many other authors but you know, everyone has a sphere of people that they can influence right like they have a specific leadership and everything so i guess michael moore and jeff Cooks like brought it to a wider circle i guess that is just what they were trying to do i guess just to get people to think about it yeah, I do really, like, I think it was you, Jennifer, said earlier, I do really appreciate that the platform that Michael Moore has and was willing to use for this because, I mean, most environmental films don't get 8 million people watching. So I think that that was really a powerful thing. And I, I'm, I am hopeful that more people with a large platform will be able to take resolve from what Michael Moore did. Although, you know, he got so much flack for it. <laughs> they know what they're in for, I guess. Uh, I guess one of the most useful things you can do sometimes when you're engaged in struggle is provoke a reaction. <laughs> no reaction, no change. Maybe. I like that, Jennifer. No reaction, no change. <laughs> That's a good way to, it's a good point to end on, I think. <laughs> Well, thank you all for participating. I really enjoyed the conversation. I really enjoyed um, the conversation with old friends and with new ones too. It's so good to meet you. Thank you. This was really fun.
thank you again.